Hello Internet, I'm called Matt, and welcome to the end of Band Films Week. I have one more video tomorrow, that's a live stream, it's going to be at this time. But, right now, I'm going to do a recommendations video. Today I would like to talk to you about my favorite band films from here in America. Obviously different films have been banned in different places, and I wanted to start today with my home country, America. Not a lot of films have been banned here. And in fact, of the films that are banned, even fewer were banned nationwide. Usually it was just one state or even one county banning these films. I also want to explain what I mean by a banned film, because I feel like a lot of people are misunderstanding the concept. Like, a lot of people think Song of the South is a banned film, which it's not. Uh, legally, it is allowed to be shown, it's just that Disney has elected not to show it. And not that I think companies should get in the habit of pulling their films from distribution, but I do think there is quite a bit of difference between a company electing not to show a film and the government saying, you can't show this film. I also feel like a ban is at least intended to be permanent. There are a handful of films Wikipedia lists as being banned that were just legally delayed. There was like a documentary about Hillary Clinton that legally couldn't be released that close to her announcing her presidential candidacy. It was always intended to be released. That court order was not, you can't release it, it's you can't release it right now. And I don't consider that a banned film. Not that I was ever going to recommend that anyway. Also, the Wikipedia article on films banned in the U.S. is not completely accurate. There are a few films I know were banned that aren't on the list. There are also a lot of instances of them putting weird reasons for why the film got banned. And sure, the U.S. might say, oh, it's banned for this reason, when there's clearly another reason they'd want to ban it. Take the film I Am Curious, Yellow, a film that was very clearly pro-USSR, pro-communism, that got banned because there's a penis in it. I'm sure that's actually why it got banned. And then they toned down the communist overtones, cut that scene out, and released it as I Am Curious Blue, and... It was a cool gimmick. We released the same movie twice and not just a, a censored and an uncensored version. Also, that movie is boring as shit, so we're not going to talk about it. Take our first example, the 1961 film Victim, which Wikipedia says was banned in several cities due to language and not because it's about a homosexual in 1961. Literally, you can click the article and just read this whole section about how it was banned because it had a homosexual in it. Victim is a very interesting film. It was a big step in uh, gay representation in film, and I can't believe it's as overlooked as it is. I feel like if you want to talk about queer representation in film, you basically have to start with the victim. Uh, the story follows a rich homosexual man whose uh, secret lover has just committed suicide over uh, a blackmail issue he's been caught up in. So the man, Melville Farr, goes to see what he can find about the people blackmailing his former lover and finds there are a lot of homosexuals in town that are also getting blackmailed by these people. And he spends the whole movie trying to track down these blackmailers and send them to jail. It's a British film from the early 60s, and at the time, I think it was illegal to be homosexual in Britain. Thus, these guys are blackmailing homosexuals, because if it comes out that you're homosexual, you go to jail. Thus, what sparked the controversy. Of course, in Britain, it was released with only a few lines cut, but... Here in America, it was actually against the Hayes Code to have homosexuals as a big plot point in your film until two or three years after this came out. So it does stand as one of the few examples on the list that was technically banned nationwide. Of course, it's a very interesting film. All the performances are great. The topic is really fascinating to get into. And I am 
kind of shocked that it's faded into obscurity the way it has when it is so important to queer representation in film. By the way, happy throwing bricks at Cops Week. It's finally here. I'm wearing my corporate-sponsored gay shirt to celebrate. There's, there's like a single green stripe. So that might disappear in front of the green screen. I could just mask it out, but... I'm not gonna. There's just gonna be a hole in my chest. Just like... internally. Next I'd like to talk about Promises Promises, starring the American sex symbol Jane Mansfield, who was way better than Marilyn Monroe. Fight me. In this film, Jane Mansfield became the first American actress to appear fully naked in a major motion picture. Which is kind of what tipped off the controversy. It's about two, three minutes of footage of her naked, but they keep replaying that clip over and over again. Now, to be fair, I'm watching the 2019 version, which has not been edited at all, so it's very possible they put those scenes back in, uh, and it was not that lewd in 1963. Honestly, of the films on this list, it's kind of my least favorite, though it is a pretty funny comedy. I got a lot of laughs out of it. This is also the only directorial credit for director King Donovan, so I will almost certainly be making an episode of a filmography of one about it. So that being the case, I think I'll just end it there. Funny comedy, Jane Mansfield gets naked, it got banned. Next up I'd like to talk about Scarface, and no, not the one from the 80s where they swear and do cocaine and kill a guy with a chainsaw. The one from the 30s, about bootlegging liquor. I was worried about showing this digital code on camera, but it expired in 2012, so uh, if you want that, it's yours. There's no indication on this box that it includes the Scarface from the 30s. It's just a nice bonus. While overseas, it was things like horror films and particularly violent action films that tended to get banned. What got banned here in America much more often was crime movies. I guess under the assumption that if you glorified crime, Americans would do crime. So as a result, a lot of the films that got banned here, like Scarlet Street and Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye, are just crime movies. And of them, Scarface is easily my favorite. I actually think there's some very interesting connections to be made to its 80s counterpart, because uh, both films are essentially the same plot, but they are both so of their time. Like, the 30s Scarface is about a guy taking over a bootleg liquor operation during the Prohibition years, whereas the 80s one is about dealing cocaine, the popular drug of the 80s. There's also a huge disparity between what you could get away with in the 30s and what you could get away with in the 80s. As I mentioned, the 80s Scarface was not banned, and the 30s one was. <laughs> This came out not long before the Hayes Code was enacted, and I think was one of the big contributing factors to Hollywood creating the Hayes Code. The Hayes Code, for those of you unaware, was what we had before the current MPAA rating system, and it was basically just, is your movie approved for theaters or not? There was no indication of how appropriate it was. So, pre the Hayes Code, films like Scarface got released, and immediately got banned in five states and a handful of cities. It's just a super fun gangster movie, one of the best of its time. If you like old gangster movies, absolutely worth the check out. And if you're a fan of the 80s version, which it is a great movie, I'd recommend you check it out as well. Moving right along, since this is in no particular order, let's talk about Tin Drum. Tin Drum is this fascinating surrealist film from 1979, that ended up not getting banned until 1997. Quick on the draw there, guys. It was also banned exclusively in one county in Oklahoma, but boy did they ever crack down on it. The assertion was that there was a scene where a little kid hugged a naked woman, and therefore, it's child porn. And police started raiding people's houses looking for copies of it, video nasties style. The film's really good, there's a lot to unpack with it in terms of, like, symbolism. Uh, it kind of reminds me of, like, an Alejandro Jodorowsky movie. It is a bit weird, and it goes on a bit long, so I'd absolutely understand if this wasn't quite your thing. 
Uh, if you're not into surrealist movies, this is just not going to be for you. And I understand that. But if you're willing to put in the legwork, I think there's a lot here to unpack about fascism and art and originality. Uh, the film was about the story of this boy who uh, suffers a spine injury that causes him to never grow older, so he's perpetually stuck as an eight-year-old. And it tells the story of his journey through World War II and post-war Germany. I say it's surreal. It's not that weird. The story is fairly straightforward. But still, there's a lot of stuff there that is clearly not meant to be taken literally. Next up, I'd like to talk about Freaks from Todd Browning, the director of the original Dracula. Freaks is a very creepy movie about a bunch of circus freaks and the bond they share being the weird, the outcast, and how protective they are of each other. This leads to some creepy sequences, but oddly, it always feels sympathetic towards the freaks, even when it's showing them in these weird scenes. They're not doing this because they're, like, monsters. They're doing this for revenge. It's totally justifiable. It also reminds me a little of that scene from Toy Story. I, I think Toy Story might have been influenced by this movie. This was pre Hayes Code area, so you could get away with a little bit more than you could not long after. That said, the film was drastically shortened upon its release from about a 90 minute runtime to nearly a 60 minute runtime. One woman even threatened to sue Warner Brothers because she had a miscarriage after watching the movie? Chris, the question becomes, is this exploitative to these people? And my answer to that is, it is less exploitative than the circus sideshows they found these people in. But maybe a little. In particular, the main characters are... Dwarves, midgets, little people. I don't know what term is preferred now. These people, okay? Uh, they're the main characters, and nowadays they're kind of just accepted as a normal part of society. Now, back in the day, these people were pretty much exclusively seen in circus sideshows, so it can be a little odd for a modern audience going, well, these just look like people I'd see on the street. But again, it stays sympathetic to the freaks, even in the scenes where it's using them for horror. And speaking of horror, let's get into our next installment, Haxen, which will also lead us into the final two installments on this list. See, the movies America likes to ban are crime movies, especially ones with a lot of violence in them, uh, films with a lot of sex in them, but they also really, really don't like movies that are kinda anti-Christian. Not outright blasphemous movies. I would say there are very few outright blasphemous movies. But just movies that sort of tinker with the idea of being anti-Christian. And Hexen is interesting because it almost reads as if the people making the film wanted this to be a genuine documentary of something that definitely happens and not just a document of what people think witches and covens and Satanists did in that time. Listen guys, witchcraft is not real, magic is not real, no one was doing these things. That said, Haxon does serve as a very interesting documentation of what people thought it was witches were doing. Additionally, it's just visually very stunning. Um, the appearance of Satan in this film has influenced depictions of Satan throughout cinema, everything from legend to Tenacious D in the Pick of Destiny. It's fascinating, it's fun, it's so gorgeous to look at. It genuinely stands as a great example of an early horror film. Uh, Haxon, in fact, is public domain. However, it was released as a silent film and was later dubbed over by a narrator. And I don't know if the version with the narrator is public domain or not. If I'm being honest, I think I'd recommend the version with the narrator. It's a little bit longer, it's got a little more information, uh, and last I checked it was on Amazon Prime, so hopefully that is actually public domain. 
But, you know, if you want a good early example of satanic horror, Haxon. I'm still canonically trapped in hell, aren't I? These videos take place outside the continuity of Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show. The only things in canon are Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show and the top ten lists. Moving on to yet more religious movies, let's talk about Martin Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ. Of course, this film was protested in a lot of places because Christians found it blasphemous. Even though if you watched it all the way to the end, you'd see why that's not really the case. And in the city of Savannah, Georgia, these protests actually went through, and they managed to get this film banned. To me, Last Temptation of Christ is a fascinating movie. It openly admits in the beginning it is not a biblical movie, and I would not say it's blasphemous, although it is maybe theologically unsound. But you know, it's a work of fiction. It's more of an emotional depiction of the life of Jesus Christ. In fact, I would very much compare it to something like Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, some of the distinct differences between this movie and the traditional story of Jesus Christ, uh, in this version, uh, Jesus is just like a man and the role of Messiah is bestowed upon him rather than him being the magical son of God. But the part that really got it in trouble is an extended sequence in which Jesus comes down from the cross and lives the rest of his life out as a normal man. And that got a lot of people riled up, like, Oh my god, you, Jesus died on the cross, he can't not die on the cross. But if you just watch the movie, spoiler alert here, if you just watch the movie, you'd see why that's wrong. I don't know, I think it's really well filmed, really well acted, a really fascinating adaptation of the story. And of course, my favorite of all these banned movies, Monty Python's Life of Brian. If you haven't seen Life of Brian, what are you doing? Watch Life of Brian, it's so good, I love it, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Of course, this is yet another one where Christians went, boo-hoo, you got Jesus in there. It's, it's not even about Jesus. He's in one scene. It just takes place in biblical times. It's not an attack on Christianity. It's just a comedy movie. Chill the fuck out. I think it is very respectful of Christianity as a religion. It does sort of poke fun at the church. And that maybe could get on some people's nerves. You know what is cool, though? Life of Brian. It's a really good movie. Watch it. Well, that's all for today. Uh, I hope you're having a great Band Films Week. I hope you've found some Band Films you can go and watch yourself. And uh, until next time, I'm Matt, and I hope you have a nice day.